So uh, my name is Roy Benalta. I'm uh, from New York. Originally, I'm from Israel. This is where the accent from. So I've been with Amazon Web Services uh, five years plus. Uh, I had several roles within Amazon Web Services, uh, from uh, solution architect um, uh, to business development. And today, I'm leading our uh, global data and analytics practice in the world. What we do, we work with customers, helping them to uh, build, um, to solve business problems using machine learning and data analytics, right? So it involves things like you heard probably like data warehouse, data lakes, uh, uh, real-time streaming analytics. And today in, in our session, I'm just the appetizer, so I'm not going to speak too much. Um, but what I want to cover today, and uh, before I will present AL from Intel, um, we're going to cover the following. Um, I think the theme of the session, and especially for folks that are starting their journey um, on the cloud or with services like real time. It's about the journey of their data and analytics and the data pipeline that they're building. So I'm going to talk about how, you, what is the journey from to serverless analytics and then we go deep dive into technical concept of using AWS Lambda and Amazon Kinesis. Um, one, it will be with Kinesis Data uh, Streams, Kinesis Data Firehose, um, give you some gotchas of some best practice that we have learned from our customers of some best practice that we publish and then you will learn from Intel about their journey of how they build the session so it's a 300 level so it's, it's going to be quite technical um, just quick questions how many of you are not using Kinesis today raise your hand okay how many are not using AWS Lambda yet okay we have some few folks um, that, so we'll start with that. So when we talk about analytics, traditionally this is the analytics stack that used to look like, I think, from the end of the 90s, where we, um, as, as a business owner, we wanted to have a one single source of truth in one place, taking all our data from different system. Now, traditionally it was data came from RDBMS database, very structured data, right? Data that comes from your ERP system, from your... Um, Oracle, MySQL type of database. You put it in some large data warehouse, and on top of that, you um, attach business intelligence uh, products like Tableau or uh, MicroStrategy or other BI tools uh, for you to ask questions about the data. The challenges where, where you went to uh, using this approach is that first, there is a large capital expense that you need to write. So I don't know how many of you are familiar or had experience with some of the appliance data warehouse costs to 10 or 50K per, per terabyte per year. Um, you know, scaling operational of that one become challenges is scale. And over, over the last years, um, what, what we have seen and probably you also experience is moving to the notion of uh, data lake. And the journey to data lake is using Amazon S3 as your uh, place when you store all your raw data because it supports structures, unstructured data, right? Can be like JSON feeds that you're getting or like CSV or some, some text file that you want to put in one place. Then you have on top of it different analytics tool for different uh, business use case, different type of uh, uh, processing that you need to run, if you need to run a training on the machine learning. Now, this is a repeat session, so we couldn't uh, uh, talk on Monday when we presented it. So um, as you heard from Andy in his keynotes, we um, announced this week on AWS uh, Lake Formation, which is a managed uh, a data lake offering that can allow you to build uh, something like data lake in, in days and not taking like months. As, okay? So uh, we'll have a preview starting soon, so that's another journey. But in addition to that, and the benefits of, of the concept of data lake, there is the notion of serverless. So to level set, what does it mean serverless? Uh, and, and for those that didn't raise, raise their hand that are not using something like AWS Lambda, so there are four tenets that we are always looking when we talk about serverless. First one, no provisioning or no management of any EC2 or compute, right? Let someone else do it for you. Automatic scaling, if you have uh, 10 transactions per second, or you have a function that needs to run 10,000 times in a second, um, the compute that you will require to do that will automatically will scale up and down, and you will pay only for the functions and the number of times of the function that runs. 
You also want to pay for value. It means that you want to make sure when you build your software stack, the BOM, the bill of material of the software, you can get to the function level of how much a function costs to me, right? If you look at the pricing model, and this is really key of when you calculate the, how much you pay for, for function. And of course, high availability and, and secure. Uh, it's important for uh, customers that are running in a compliance environment, like they need a VPC or HIPAA. So these are the four uh, tenets that we talk about the operational model of serverless. Now, as a result, you as an engineer or a DevOps or an architect, you're shifting your uh, business to focus like 10% on the infrastructure and 90% of the time on building the business logic that you need for your, your stack, regardless if you're using it for, for analytics workload or even for application development. And that's really the focus of differentiation. If you are looking at the um, AWS serverless portfolio today, and I'm not going to cover each one of the services, and as you all came to the keynotes and Today you heard from Werner, there are additional things that we need to add to this slide, so it's not updated, I can, I, it's a repeat session. At this session, we are going to focus on uh, two or three services, AWS Lambda, Amazon Kinesis, and I also will talk about API Gateway. Uh, we're not going to cover API Gateway with WebSockets. Uh, it was announced today, pretty cool. Um, but let's start a recap of Amazon Kinesis. So um, Amazon Kinesis is a service that was built out of our necessity to solve our own problems at AWS. So for those that raised their hand, they said we don't use Kinesis, let me give you a secret. If you are using AWS, you are using Kinesis. And the reason is that Kinesis is a tier zero service, is a, is a foundation service in AWS that many other services were built on top of it. Who is using CloudWatch logs today in your system? Um, S3 events? For example, these services were built on top of Kinesis. Behind the scenes, it's running on top of Kinesis. Um, at reInvent 2016, AWS metering team uh, presented how they use Kinesis for ingesting and processing 100 million events every second just for the metering team. Um, I don't have the number today. That was back in 2016. But every traffic, everything that happens today in your account when you are creating an EC2 instance, bringing it down, or doing data transfer, everything is running through the metering. All these events are capturing for Kinesis. And Kinesis has four services today, core services. Uh, we have the Kinesis video streams. Uh, it allows you to connect um, any IP-based camera um, to the cloud by Kinesis video allows you to eventually capture all that video. Uh, it has a metadata management, and you can actually build a computer vision-based application on video. But we're focusing today on the Kinesis data stack. We have Kinesis data streams, Kinesis data firehose, and Kinesis data analytics. So most of you are familiar with Kinesis, so I will skip that. Um, and when you think about data pipeline and how it's evolving the journey, we're moving from um, batch-oriented data pipeline, right, where we wanted to create like hourly server log, or we wanted to take data once a day, we're getting feeds, but we're moving like to real-time metrics, we're moving into a way that you want to write a real-time uh, clickstream analysis, anomaly detection, a fraud detection that runs on real-time, and all these events that are coming in real-time allow you to do it with something like Kinesis, where you can have multiple applications accessing to the same data for real-time for different purposes and different type of use cases. So let's deep dive into how Lambda and Kinesis works. So, um, if you're familiar with the Amazon uh, AWS Lambda execution model, um, when it comes to Kinesis, the difference is that it's using a pod base. You have data that feeds into the Kinesis data streams. And your Lambda function, what it does, it pulls continuously data from Kinesis data streams as events are coming. And let's say that you have 10 shards or 1,000 shards or 10,000 events hundred thousands of events coming every second, Lambda will automatically will scale and every function actually will act as a worker to read and make sure that you can uh, uh, complete processing all the events that come in, in Kinesis. So um, the illustration is that you have a continuously, continuously stream that goes into Kinesis data streams. You have a Lambda function um, that, that reads from that stream. What it does, you can set up the buffer. You can say, I want to 
uh, process in, about, in micro batches, like 100 events, 1,000 events. Every second, it will continuously pull the events, and then it will invoke a function that, um, that will actually uh, execute the business logic that you develop. So in this illustration, let's say that you have a one lambda function that you want to, to update a database, and another one you want to send an SNS, because um, your lambda function is just looking on some um, threshold of a temperature. Let's say that it's an IoT device that sends some attributes like temperature, and you say every temperature that is higher than 70 degree, I will send an SNS uh, to the operator. So that's, that's one example of a use case. Um, a, a week ago, before, uh, actually five days ago, uh, before reInvent, we actually uh, announced that Lambda supports also Kinesis Data Streams, Enhance Fanout, and HTTP2. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, in Amazon Kinesis, we released in August a new feature that uh, allows you to have, when you have multiple consumers that reading from Kinesis Data Streams, you have the concept of shard, right? Shard uh, supports one megabyte per second in and two megabyte per second out. So let's say that you have uh, five consumers that reading from that stream. It means that each one of the consumer can read only 400 kilobytes per second because the shard capacity can, can support two megabytes per second out. Now, if you have like uh, one gigabyte uh, in and you need to read that, you can provision 1,000 shards to have a one gigabyte per second. But on the read, um, you were like throttled by the two megabytes per second. With this new feature, now, each one of your consumer application will have a dedicated two megabyte per second uh, um, out reading. That means that you have uh, uh, much more throughput to um, uh, fan out like some of your data. In addition, there is a concept that we use um, um, to measure latency with Kinesis data streams. Before uh, this feature, um, propagation delay uh, was around 300, 200 uh, milliseconds. And with that feature, we actually allow you now to have like a double digit milliseconds uh, latency. So up until last week, Lambda still supported the old model using the KCL version one. And with this new model, you actually benefits of using KCL with subscribe to shard that every work you actually has a dedicated read throughput. So um, what does it mean for you that latency is improved significantly um, around 65%? Some of the, uh, uh, um, um, tips I want to give you. So you want to optimize the batch size uh, for maximum throughput every time that you're using a, a Lambda with Kinesis, because the way Lambda is, is working, when it pulls each shard once per second, you want to adjust the batch, the batch size to ensure execution time is optimal. That's one thing. Also, one of the other things, as you're writing Lambda function with Kinesis, um, monitoring is important, right? Sometimes you have the Lambda function and you ask, why it failed, because Lambda has a retry mechanism, et cetera. Sometimes you don't track it because you didn't implement it to try and catch in your code. So you want to make sure that in your Lambda function, you know, as Werner said, everything fails all the time. You want to make sure that in your Lambda function you have this uh, uh, theme of using try and catch in your function and using CloudWatch to uh, process. When it doesn't make sense to use that, if you need to build something like stateful application, so uh, yesterday, uh, on Monday, we announced Kinesis Data Analytics for Java applications. So you can use Apache Flink as a managed service in Kinesis Data Analytics to uh, do something like uh, a stateful windowing, uh, sessionization, time series analysis that you need to look at the states uh, in stateful. Um, if all you need to do is take these feeds and throw it into some uh, uh, persistent storage like S3, Elasticsearch, or Redshift, use Kinesis Data Firehose. You don't need to deal with, with shards. So it really depends on the use case, but you can use both. Um, before Intel will give their, their main thought, um, I will talk about, um, um, there's the concept of ETL, extract, transform, and load. When it comes to Kinesis Data Firehose and AWS Lambda, we talk about inline transform and load. And the way it works, Firehose, for those that are not using, it's a, I call it the set and forget service. You set up a delivery stream, you tell, ah, I want to data to land in this bucket, and that's it. And what, what it does, it's just continuously streaming the data, aggregate it, and you push it into the destination. We support four destinations today, S3, Elasticsearch, Redshift, and uh, uh, Splunk. What you can do also, you can actually embed your Lambda function within this uh, ingestion mechanism when you're sending the data. So usually the, the, the ETL that you are running on the fly um, you can do something like enrichment 
For example, I get an IP address and I want to add an IP to country. So my Lambda function will go to some lookup table and will add additional fields like uh, uh, the state, etc. So you can enrich the data. The way Lambda is, is, is invoked, before the data is shipped to S3, the Lambda function will process this event and create a new file for you, and that file will land on S3. By the way, the raw data is also uh, saved, so you can go back and see if you have an error in the code, you can actually look back at the uh, historical data. Uh, another option is to use something like filtering. Let's say that you want to filter only um, events that has errors, so you can have, use that in Lambda. And actually, it saves you some traffic and loading too much data to, I don't know, to your end destination. So you can do that with Lambda function. Um, or you can do something like conversion, and that's become very popular. Um, this is an example of, of taking an access log like tab delimiter and, and, and convert it to JSON. Um, this feature that we added uh, um, uh, this year, Kinesis Data Firehose can run a Parquet and ORC conversion. So this is a, an example of how it works. Um, you integrate with Glue Data Catalog, define your schema, as the JSON data comes into Firehose, um, that conversion, it will convert to Parquet and ORC, and then it will land on S3. So that's a, a very popular uh, use case. So to summarize, um, I want to talk about the monitoring. Um, I skipped the last one because that, I, I don't want to repeat that. Um, in the Firehose data transformation, there are two uh, monitoring uh, metrics that you want to look. One is the uh, execute processes on, on the success metric. So that gives you um, the ratio between the lambda invocation and how many times they uh, um, you know, rate, because sometimes there is a failure and it, re it will uh, retry. But you want to make sure that you monitor that. And of course, the delivery to asterisk depends on the destination. Um, you want to look at the success metrics. So to summarize the advantage of serverless, um, I think the agility, the elasticity, and the total cost of efficiency as you are building a serverless streaming application, that's something that really you're benefit from, from using that. You pay for only for what you use. You don't need to manage any infrastructure. We have customers that um, their DevOps, they, they said, I, we, don't, we don't even need DevOps in, in that environment because um, we submit all the cloud metrics and we're monitoring it. But even for DevOps, they are using this type of analytics for their infrastructure monitoring to, to load that. So that was from, from my side. And now I'm, I'm very excited to, to invite uh, Eyal Levy from, from Intel. Um, so Eyal is from the Intel uh, Advanced Analytics team in, uh, and he's based in Tel Aviv. And his team, what I like about the use case is talk, it's actually related to each one of us. Um, it talks about health. And Intel started their journey with Michael J. Fox Foundation a few years back. And they work with different pharma uh, companies to help patients that has diseases like Parkinson's and, and others. And I, won't, I don't take time from Eyal, and I will invite Eyal and Warner to have him on the stage. So thank you. And Please have Eyal. Thank you, Roy, for the warm introduction. So excited to be here in Vegas, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Eyal Levy. I'm an R&D manager working at Intel. I'm leading the development of a product called Intel Farm Analytics Platform. From the slide behind me, you can see a few hints about the things we are doing. You can see sensors of a patient and insights which we provide. I'm going to explain a bit about the product during the session so we'll have some context about the problem, problems we are facing and we'll see together how we are solving those problems. What to expect from the session? I'll we start with some context about who we are. I'll we then share with you the reasons which pushed us to move into serverless. It's quite interesting to see that we actually decided to rewrite from scratch an existing flow we had. We were using quite common technologies which most, I guess that most of you are using as well, you'll see. And it's quite interesting to see how come we moved and we played something which is already works into serverless. Then we will deep dive into the flow, a flow where we collect sensor data from patients. I'm going to talk about Kinesis Streams, Kinesis Firehose, Lambda Function, API Gateway, Cognito, actually even more services. Then we'll go over the lesson learned Hopefully, I'm going to save you some time and pain, and we'll end up with results, or as I call it, the, the bottom line. 
before I start talking about who we are, I want you to meet John. John is 45 years old. John has Parkinson's disease. Parkinson, for those who are not familiar with, is a neurological disease which mainly impacts the motor system. The most, the most, the, the symptoms which are most known are movement related. For example, shaking, usually you'll see the hands like moving, slowness of movement, and difficulty with walking. John is treated with medications. There are quite good medications today, actually, to treat Parkinson. And John goes to the clinic every few months where he meets his doctor. John's doctor asks John to perform a set of activities, answer a set of questions about his condition. And by the end of this short meeting, the doctor takes different decisions. For example, switching to a different type of medication John is taking, or switching the dosage of the medication John is taking. This is quite a common use case. This is not unique for Parkinson. It's quite common for other diseases as well. This is the reality we are familiar with. This is how healthcare domain works. But what if it could be different? What if the doctor meets John every day, not just every few months? What if the doctor could evaluate John early in the morning before John takes his medications or late at night before John, when John's body is tired? What if the doctor could identify a degradation in John's condition when that happens, and not only after a few months when John goes to the clinic? This is the reality we are trying to create. Our platform enables remote patient monitoring using sensors, either wearable sensors, for example, a smartwatch, a bracelet, a patch attached to the body, or different type of sensors, for example, a sensor the patient puts under the mattress when we track breathing patterns, sleeping patterns, and other nice metrics. The data from the sensors is then being transferred to the cloud, where we have smart AI algorithms. We have actually handmade algorithms for each and every disease and symptom. The insights which we produce are then being shared with different type of users, either doctors, for looking on dashboards and aggregated data. Usually doctors will track patient progress over time, John's condition. And we have different type of users which are data scientists. They are working on top of the raw data and trying to create new algorithms to identify new symptoms or trying to improve existing algorithms based on the new data we are collecting. Our platform and our main focus is around clinical trials. Clinical trials are the phase where pharma companies develop new type of medication, and they get to a point when, where they provide this new medication to a small group of people, either a few dozens, hundreds, or thousands of patients. Today, using the platform, pharma companies are able to collect a huge amount of data 24-7 when the patient is at home, and not only when he goes to the clinic. And today, also, pharma companies are able to have a non-biased, non-human opinion showing the correlation between the medication the patient is taking and the impact it has on the, the symptoms of the patient. Looking at the medical fields we are dealing with, you can understand that we are coping with quite a lot of diseases and symptoms. We integrate many sensors to our platform meaning we need to cope with different type of data, different structure of data, different sample rate of each and every sensor. It's quite challenging, but at the same time, it's quite interesting. And I'm not a physician, I'm an engineer, so I can just share with you that I'm quite pleased to see that from an engineering perspective, the solution we have in place is quite flexible and we are coping quite well with new requirements coming when we start a new clinical trial and we start exploring new um, field of uh, health field, uh, like you see here. Let's go back to John and Parkinson use case and see how the solution is applicable in this specific case. We provide John a smartwatch where we collect accelerometer and gyroscope data, meaning we are tracking each and every movement of John's hands, both the direction and the speed. In some clinical trials in Parkinson, patients will have a smartwatch on one hand and a bracelet on the second hand, so we are tracking both hands. We also collect 
heart rate using the smartwatch, another nice metrics. In this specific case, the data from the watch is being transferred to the mobile application, which behaves like a hub. Using the mobile application, John also gets reminders to take medications, meaning obviously we are tracking that as well, and you can know the correlation between the medications and the symptoms. Using the mobile application, John is also being asked to answer a set of questions and perform a set of activities the same like he did when he was in the clinic. But the big difference is that he's doing that at home on a daily basis and not only once in a few months in the clinic. The data is being transferred to the cloud where we have, in this case, specific algorithms which identify and quantify Parkinson's symptoms, tremor, dyskinesia, and other Parkinson's symptoms. And the data is then being shared with doctors, data scientists, remotely, and we enjoy that, obviously. Now that we are all experts in remote patient monitoring, we are experts, right? Let's move on and see how the journey started and how we moved into serverless. The year is 2016. We are in production for a few years. We have a stream processing flow in place. We have great technologies. You can see MQTT broker, Kafka cluster, Akka cluster, Hadoop cluster, Nice stuff, right? And I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? Most of the developers know that. We don't we really want to touch something which works. In our case, the flow wasn't broken, okay? It wasn't broken, but still we had to fix it. Still we had to do a major change. And I'm sure you may wonder, okay, but why? In order to explain that and answer your question, let's refer those great technologies as great stuff we wish we had. I don't know about you, I wish I had. A spaceship, a sports car, a nice motorcycle, a yacht. Great stuff, right? Actually, thinking about it, owning a spaceship can be a real headache. We need to do all the maintenance of the spaceship. If something is broken, we need to fix it. We need to make sure it's stable enough so it will not explode in production on the way to Mars. We are probably going to upgrade different components of the spaceship. You want the latest and greatest, so we need to take care about that as well. We want to fly faster and further. And another important thing to say about spaceship is that it's quite complicated to fly one. We need a lot of expertise. But after we have those expertise, it still doesn't mean that we know how to drive a car or ride a motorcycle. So in order to have all of those great stuff or great flow, we, have, we need to have quite a lot of expertise. And the last thing I can say about those great stuff is that they are quite expensive. They are quite expensive, and we may find some, sometimes that we are using those great stuff in very strong technologies or vehicles when we can use something much simpler. We may find that we are flying to the supermarket using a spaceship instead of just walking or using bicycles, or using the great yacht we have only once a year and it's sitting, doing nothing, we are paying for the storage of the spaceship, not spaceship, the yacht. Eventually, the fact that we spend so much time over the flow in production, this is only one of the flows we have in production. The, the time we spent over scalability, stability, monitoring, all the expertise we need to have, the time we did that instead of focus on new capabilities and new features, and the fact that the solution was so expensive, we had tons of EC2 machines behind each and every technology in this case. The combination of those made it quite clear for us that we need a change. We need something simpler, we need a lighter solution. And again, I'm repeating, we need a solution which will enable us to focus on our business and reduce the time we spend over production maintenance. An important thing to mention here is that although I'm working at Intel, which is quite a big enterprise company, this specific product runs like a startup. We do not have a DevOps team doing the work for us. No one is going to create a cluster for us, or no one is going to get up in the middle of the night when something breaks. The team which I'm leading are responsible both for production maintenance and for new features, and we better focus on that. The first decision we had to take was to change our approach and the way we see AWS. Up until that point, we held a cloud agnostic approach. We held an on-premise approach. 
We made sure that all the technologies we are using will enable us to move to any other cloud vendor when we want to. But the fact was that we were sitting on AWS for a few years. We were quite pleased back then. We are very pleased today. And there was no real intention to move out of AWS. Therefore, the first decision was to start see AWS as a service provider and not just a virtual data center. And now that we are open for changes, let's go over a stream processing flow. We'll talk about the architecture, the components we need, and the objectives we have. After coping with the problem of receiving data from sensors and making the mobile application behave as a hub, the first step we have in the flow in the back end is the data ingestion, where we need to receive the data, manipulate it a bit, perform enrichment, meaning extract data from the database. Then we're going to move that to the next step, which is the stream processing step, where we need to be able to run algorithms and produce insights. Both the raw data and the insights are then going to be stored and integrated with different type of analytic, analytic tools which are going to be used by different type of users. The whole flow needs to be scalable. We have tons of data. Data from a single patient and a single sensors means millions of records per day. And quite important, we need a low TCO, total cost of ownership. We want to be agile. We want to reduce the time we spent over production maintenance. We do not want spaceships. Speaking about the data ingestion step, this is the entry point of the flow. The most important requirement we have from the entry point is the scalability. On one hand, we need scalability. But on the other hand, we don't want to take care about scalability. It sounds strange, right? We need something, and we don't want to take care about it. For the first step, we have decided to go with Lambda. As data hits API Gateway, it, being pass, uh, it passes aut authorization using Amazon Cognito. We're actually using Amazon Cognito for all of the authentication and authorization processes in our platform. Once the request passes the auto authorization, it triggers the Lambda function, and we can go and implement the code we have. This way, we achieve scalability. For each and every request coming into the system, a new Lambda function is going to be triggered. We enjoy simplicity. We have all of those, this scalability. It's like a magic done for us. We don't really need to work hard in order to achieve that. And we enjoy cost optimization. We don't have an EC2 machine sitting doing nothing. We don't need to take care about scaling up, scaling down, according to the number of events, requests coming into the system. And we have quite a big difference between the, the amount of requests coming. And we, it's not a stable stream. The next step we need to do with the Lambda function is enrichment. We need to extract data from the database. But here it becomes tricky. When we thought about the design of the flow, we were quite concerned from the fact that we are going to have a direct connection between the database and the Lambda function. We were quite concerned because we just said how great Lambda scalability is, but it also means that as Lambda scale, we're going to have more and more connections created against the database. And the database is being shared the course of our platform. Therefore, we didn't know if like, it's the right thing to do. Then we thought about a quite common use case. A use case where data is being aggregated on the edge device, meaning we are getting bursts of data in short period of time. We are getting the same, not, it's not the same data, but data from the same patient and the same sensor, meaning that all the enrichment processes we are doing are done the same for all of those requests coming in a short period of time. It was quite clear that we need some kind of a caching mechanism in between the Lambda function and the database. Instead of going with the common cache solutions like Redis memcache, we found out that there is a much simpler solution and actually also a cheaper one. We have decided to create an internal API gateway and enable cache. This covers the caching requirement we have. In regards to the database connections, we have created a service deployed as a container on ECS Fargate. We have connections pools in this place. By doing those 
steps by doing this change in the design, we have actually reduced the dependency between the Lambda function and the database. The dependency still exists, but it's not as tight as it was, and using the cache in between and the connection pool with the service, it works. Another thing to mention here in this flow is you can see that you are using NLB, Network Load Balancer. Small tip for you, just make sure you are familiar with all the options of the load balancers AWS has to offer. In this case, we've decided to go with NLB because of different compatibility issues of the other services, load balancers. So I won't go into that now, it's too technical, but read about it and maybe it will save you some time, hopefully. Great, we have a scalable entry point of the flow, and the next step is the stream processing step. This is where we need to be able to run multiple algorithms in parallel. You can see here algorithm A, B, and C. Each algorithm consumes different type of data. Algorithm A and B consume acceler accelerometer data, and algorithm C consume gyroscope data. Meaning we need not only the ability to run the algorithms in parallel and in scale, obviously, we also need some kind of a routing mechanism which will, which will route be between the type of data we have and the lambda functions, our algorithms, which need to run on top of this specific um, data. For that, we've decided to go with Kinesis streams and lambda functions as the consumers. As Roy mentioned, there are different options to implement Kinesis streams consumers. My preferred one is going with lambda function. I will explain in a minute why. As data hits Kinesis streams, it triggers multiple lambda functions. Each lambda function contains a specific algorithm which consumes the raw data and produces insight. And the routing requirement I just mentioned is simply achieved by having and creating a dedicated stream for each type of data we have. We're going to have a specific stream for accelerometer data and a different dedicated stream for gyroscope data. And actually the lambda function, the consumer, each one is going to be listening to a specific stream. Once we'll have this type of data, it will trigger the consumers which are pending for the stream. Now let's complicate things a bit, okay? Let's talk about data and complexity around the data. Our algorithms, in order to identify a symptom, for example, a tremor in the hand, our algorithms needs a time frame of data. We need between a few seconds up to a minute of data in order to know that the patient is not just moving the hand, but actually it's a tremor. It means that in this flow, the lambda function needs to pull hundreds of records from Kinesis streams. But after pulling hundreds of records, we will find out that we have a mixture of data from multiple users. So we need to pull hundreds of records, sort those on a patient level, and only then we can run the algorithm. But still there is a problem. After sorting the data, there is still no guarantee that we have enough in order to identify the symptom. Maybe we don't have a time frame which is large enough to do that. It's quite a complicated problem. And actually there are different options to solve this problem. For example, we can go and replace the lambda function with an EC2 machine or container. We can go and use persistency or cache, extract records from Kinesis, sort those, understand that we don't have enough on patient level, put that on the cache or persistency, extract the next batch, sort again, see that we do have enough on a patient level, then we can go and run the algorithm. It will work, it's doable, but it's quite a complicated solution. If we'll go with this direction, there are too many edge cases we need to take care of. And if we haven't noticed, actually what we are doing here is we are maintaining a state on the patient level, or maintaining a state between the batch of records we pull from Kinesis to the next batch we are going to pull from Kinesis, and we need to do that on each and every patient, right? It could be nice if we could find a solution which is stateless. A solution that if it's stateless, maybe we can even go back and use lambda function and enjoy all the benefits of lambda function. When we thought about the problem, we tried to force ourselves and find a stateless solution. And quite quickly we find one. We found a quite simple solution 
where we have decided to compress two and a half minutes of data and send that as a single request to the backend. The single request of two and a half minutes of data is then being set as a single record in Kinesis, meaning now the Lambda function pulls only a few records from Kinesis and not hundreds of records. Each record is already a processing unit ready to be worked on. It's already enough data, two and, a half minutes of, two and a half minutes of data from a single patient and a sensor, meaning that the problem I just described, it's like it disappeared. We don't need to sort the data. We don't need to maintain a state on a patient level. We can go back and enjoy and use Lambda function. And this is what we are doing, actually. Now that we have coped with quite a complicated problem, and it became quite simple, right? Let's talk about the storage. We need to store the data, both the raw data, huge amount of data, and the insight. The first requirement we had from a storage solution was the ability to integrate different analytic tools. We want to minimize the amount of ETLs we are doing. We want to minimize the amount of duplications of the data we have. This was the first requirement. Second was scalability. As I mentioned, we have a lot of data. And the last requirement was the cost. It could be nice if we can find a solution which is not too expensive. Again, we are in the state mind of startup, even though we are inside Intel. Question for the crowd. We are sitting on AWS. We need a simple, scalable storage solution Anyone can think about something? <laughs> We're actually using S3 as our main storage solution. You can see here that we have two different buckets in S3. In the first one, we keep the data in a JSON format. As data hits Kinesis streams, triggers Lambda function, we produce the insights. The insights are then being written to Kinesis Firehose where, like Roy mentioned, if you are going to write data to S3 or Redshift or Elastic, just go ahead and use Elastic. Quite simple. Just define the time frame or time interval or buffer size, and that's it. Using the firewalls, we write the data in JSON. The second bucket we have, we actually keep the data in Parquet. Parquet is a columnar compressed format, and it's quite important to use that if you want, and you want to improve the performance of the tools which are going to read the data from S3. When we started using Firehose, it didn't support writing Parquet. It wrote for us and still writing JSON. This is why we are migrating JSON into Parquet. For those who are going to use that, uh, use Firehose today, you are going to enjoy and you can use directly Parquet. But actually, there, there is another reason why we have two different buckets. When working with S3, we need to remember that this is not a database. We don't have a primary key. We don't have a unique index. Meaning that if for some reason the, the, the same data is going to come twice to your flow, and it's going to happen. For example, there is a network connection between the mobile application and the backend. Same request is going to be sent twice. And you may find that both of the requests actually pass the flow, and we have data duplication. Therefore, we have two different buckets. We're not only migrating data from JSON to Parquet, but in between, we are also removing duplications. This is a repeat session. Some people ask me later, just to, to make sure you understand, what you see here is quite close to what we have in production, but this is a simplified flow. We have monitoring in between. We have the step between the two buckets. It's a bit more complicated than you see here. Speaking about storage and data, the most precious piece of information we have is the raw data. Raw data is the gold. If we have the raw data, we can run, in the future, new algorithms. But if we lose the raw data, there is no way back. Because raw data is the gold, we have decided to write it directly to S3 as soon as possible, meaning in the first step of the flow, we actually bypass the whole flow we have and directly write that to S3. And can someone think why we are doing that? We are doing that because we are humans. 
We are humans, we are going to have bugs, we are going to have problems between the services. And if this is the gold, the first thing we are going to do is keep the data we got compressed even before the enrichment, and only then we are starting the whole flow. In your case, make sure you know what is the gold and make sure you store that backup because again, find your gold. Now that we have the gold stored and safe, we want to share the gold, both the raw data and the insights with our customers, the doctors and data scientists. For that, we have different tools which we are using. I'm going to talk about a few of those. The first tool I want to talk about is Amazon Athena. Amazon Athena is a great service. I really like Amazon Athena. It's a service which enables you query data which is sitting in a tree using a standard SQL syntax. It's so simple, all you need to do is define the schema of your data, make sure you keep the data with partitions and parquet, and that's it. It's a totally serverless solution. You just pay by the query you are running, and one of my favorite, because it's so simple and no maintenance and all of the, the stuff be, uh, around it. The second option we provide for data scientists is the ability to spin up an EMR, Elastic Map Reduce cluster on demand. This is the heavy duty tool. This is where we are running Hadoop cluster. Usually data scientists are using that when they need to run mature algorithms on top of huge amount of data, data which was collected during a few months or years, or when they need to run algorithms across patients' algorithms, different than the ones we saw in the flow. The next option for data scientists is Zeppelin notebooks. This is where they are playing with algorithms. This is where they run algorithms on small amount of data, and it's quite nice and simple. And the last tool I want to discuss is Amazon QuickSight. Amazon QuickSight is part of our dashboard solution. And by, you, by creating, by using Amazon QuickSight, you can quite quickly create nice graphs, um, tables, and share dashboards, obviously, and share that with your customers. That's it. We have a complete flow end to end. It's totally, totally scalable. Most of the places are actually scalable automatically. We don't need to take care about the scalability of the components. It's quite a simple flow, right? Um, John doesn't think it's so simple. Okay, I, I tend to agree, okay? It's not a simple flow. It's not a simple flow, and as I mentioned, the real flow is a bit even more complicated. We have a lot of components, we have dependencies, we have business logic. It's not a simple flow, but the important part is the bottom line. And the bottom line is the fact that today, the time we spent over production maintenance is minimal compared to the time we spent before. And this was one of the main objectives, and this is why we are so happy for the move we have done. Let's go over some lessons learned. A few of those I mentioned in the session, and I'm going to add a few more. we we'll start with Lambda function. I think that the first thing you notice when you start working with Lambda function is the fact that it forces you to design a stateless solution. And I think it's great. I think it's great because we are used to have solutions which are based on database, we are based on persistence in cache, and it's okay because using those components, we are solving quite a complicated problems. But now, if we want to use Lambda function properly, we need to think about stateless solutions, and you will find out that in some cases, the, the solution is much more simple. And I think the, the best use case, like the, the example I just described, when we compress the data before starting the flow, it's like totally different complexity of the flow. Second thing I can say about Lambda function is that the biggest strength of Lambda function is scalability. When you write Lambda function, make sure you write thin and simple function, and most important, make sure you reduce and minimize the dependency you have from your function in other components. If you're not going to do that, you will quickly understand that the strength of scalability is becoming a problem because the other components cannot scale at the same level of your lambda. For those who are new with lambda function, and I saw a few back there, 
when you bring lambda functions and you just start using that in your, into your organization, you will see that developers embrace that. They quite quickly start writing lambda functions in Python code. You will also see that quite quickly are going to have code duplications. In our case, we've decided to use shared Python libraries across the Lambda functions. I know that it's against the microservice approach, but this is what we are doing. We want better control over the code we have in production. We wanted to reduce the duplication, and we decided to find like the approach in between, in between the microservices and the ability to have better control of the, over the code. Last thing I can say about Lambda function, make sure you plan ahead before you start deploying to production. Make sure you know how you're going to release and deploy and monitor your functions. If you're just starting with few ones, it's okay, but as you're going to add more and more, you must know the exact version of each Lambda function. You need to have good monitoring and to know that it's healthy and make sure you are doing that from the beginning. Kinesis data stream. As long as it's applicable to your case, try and aggregate the data before you write it into Kinesis. By doing that, by creating processing units, you may find out that you can simplify the flow you have, and you are probably going to be able to enjoy also a stateless solution and going to enjoy the, the option of using Lambda function as a consumer. Second thing is the consumer. I guess you can already understand that I'm quite a fan of Lambda function. So this is my preferred option as consumer when speaking about Kinesis streams. And I prefer that, again, the same benefits of Lambda function, the scalability and the optimization and all of those. Compress data before you write it to Kinesis. When compressing data, you will find out that you can reduce the number of shards you have, meaning you are going to enjoy quite a lot of cost reduction. So compress data before writing to Kinesis. And last thing, use Kinesis firewalls and use Parquet while writing the same like service which already exists and so simple to use. Quick wins. I've decided to write down a few of the services which are quite simple to use, meaning that if we are not using those yet, go ahead, read about them, because it's so simple and it's actually a quick win. The first one is Athena. If you have data in S3, if you're not using Athena yet, go ahead, start using it. It's like a matter of minutes, really minutes, and you're going to enjoy that. Second is API Gateway. Use API Gateway, enable cache, and when you start using API Gateway, I guess you, it will happen something like happened for us. You will see, for example, that Cognito is, has quite a plug -in, good plug and play integration and Lambda functions as well. Cognito, I think that the best example for the things which all of the people which are sitting here, we are all using and doing the same things, we all need to take care about authentication and authorization. Before starting Cognito, we had already an authentication and authorization flow. But when we had to add new features and new capabilities, we've decided to throw the solution we had and move to Cognito and enjoy all the capabilities which already exist there and enjoy all the future capabilities which AWS are adding on the way. So go ahead, again, quite a simple service and quite simple to integrate, especially if you're working with API Gateway. And the last tip I want to mention is the way we have rolled out our solution to production. It's at least the, the first phase of the rollout. We actually decided to release a parallel flow. We've decided to create an end-to-end -end beta flow, a thin one. We made sure the dependencies we have in the existing com components in production is minimal. And by doing that, we were able to identify quite quickly the mistakes we are doing, and we had few mistakes. And we uh, had the option to build confidence in the direction we are going. Few things about how we did it. In the, pre in the, it's not the first slide, but in the previous solution we had, the first component was MQTT Broker. So all we had to do is to add another client to MQTT Broker, meaning we consume the same data in parallel. So we had the existing production flow. We had a new, totally new flow in parallel. 
So even if something breaks in the new flow, there is no impact on the existing production solution. Try and find the tweaks where you can do that, and you will gain confidence in this direction. Where are we today? We have moved on from those great technologies, which were also quite expensive and complicated, to a solution which is much lighter, much simpler. And yes, it is much simpler. We don't need to maintain all the technologies and have all the expertise. We have moved now, and we actually enjoy the fact that part of the burden of the maintenance of production is actually covered by using AWS services. By doing that, when you plan to do such a move, usually you should consider that the solution is going to cost more money, right? Because you are going to pay for someone or a service to take care of something which you have done. But actually, in our case, not just that it's not more expensive, it's the opposite. Uh, let's see a few numbers. In the previous solution we had, in this specific flow, we had 21 EC2 machines, and it's crazy. 21 EC2 machines, both the cost and all the headache around those. Today we have zero. We don't have even one EC2 machine. We have a totally serverless solution. In regard to cost reduction, we enjoy 75% cost reduction. This is huge. And 75% cost, cost reduction is only the price of the hardware, the machines, the C2 machines, and all the services. You can go and add all the time we, we spend and we save today where developers are focusing on new capabilities. It's really crazy. And you may ask, okay, so what's next? Next, as I mentioned, this is only one of the flows. We are working on other flows in the platform. And next is to apply the same methodologies, the same services or equivalent, and enjoy cost reduction, stability, scalability, and the fact that we can focus on new capabilities and our product and not on the production maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Eyal. Um, so that was our last session. Thank you, everyone, for staying here, and um, there are some recommendation best practice from AWS, probably saw these slides many times if you went to several track. Um, this one, we actually put it on Monday, but when you go back home, you know, all these sessions will be on YouTube. You might want to check this too. Um, the first one is about technology and trends and data lakes and analytics. That session was uh, delivered by Anurag Gupta, who's our vice president for uh, database and analytics, and the leadership session around DevOps, microservices, serverless, uh, uh, and how you accelerate innovation. Uh, it's a, another great session you should watch. Um, we have time for questions, so um, anyone that has questions, feel free uh, yeah, to ask. Want, we we are going to be idea. here, so you yeah. can come and ask questions. So again, guys, enjoy replay party, whoever is going. Um, thank you very much for attending. Don't forget to fill out the surveys. Um, it's important for us also to make sure we can improve the content and everything. So your feedback is highly appreciated. So hopefully you'll learn something and have a great journey with your data and analytics and serverless track. Bye.